One thing I thought about through the years after we did that interview almost, what, 20 years ago, was um, you had told me about a time after you had recorded the Dream Evil album and Vinny and Jimmy had sat you down and tried to convince you to hand over some of your publishing? Yeah, that happened, actually. That happened. And I think a lot of it came from when Viv left. They all thought that Ronnie had broken his promise. And, um, I mean, I was there from the beginning. I remember seeing Ronnie. I was even at the rehearsals. I mean, I'd, I'd be at Mates in North Hollywood, and the truck would show up with their gear, and there was nobody there to load or unload. And so Ronnie would start unloading the truck with the road with the roadies that worked at Mates because none of his roadies or his band members were there yet. It was just him and I. So we started unloading the truck and setting up that kind of thing. He was a real hands-on and he did, he gave it his all. And so it was basically, and this is what I saw that it made perfect sense why they all thought they were going to get a piece of the pie. And I think they, and I think Ronnie really meant it because when you really think about it, what a great way to start. Here's Ronnie and Jimmy from rainbow and Ronnie and Vinny from black Sabbath starting a band together with this kid that nobody knows about who's fucking furious on guitar. And that first album just went, just skyrocketed. So, I mean, it's, it's not that Ronnie started a band with a bunch of nobodies. So it makes sense that he would, that he would say, Hey, by the third album or so, we'll make this more of an equal share thing because they weren't, it costs a lot of money for the buses and the, and the bus drivers and the hotel rooms, the arenas and the lighting and the, the PA system, they were bringing their own lights and their PA system, uh, an 18 foot fire breathing dragon. That's when things took a turn that I don't think very many people understood is uh, how much money was actually spent because Ronnie and Wendy, I guess, had gone to Universal Studios and saw that Conan the Barbarian performance and it had this fire breathing dragon and they thought, God, we got to do, we should do that. You know, it's just like his way of giving back to the fans. So he didn't hike up ticket prices, but it, uh, there was a lot of money being spent. And I think at that was the time when the band was expecting to get their, you know, like an equal share. And, but it was so expensive to do that. So apparently, I guess Viv comes from a, a, a wealthy family. So I think he was more of, not that he's a spoiled brat or anything, but I remember Ronnie saying stuff like that. Every time I've ever met Vivian, he was always very nice to me. So I can't back that up one way or the other. But I know how Ronnie is, and so to to piss Ronnie off to the point where he fires you, you got to be pretty insulting. Um, so something must have gone down. It comes off like Vivian says, I called him on his promise, and he lied to us. I don't really think it was that. I think it was more of a deferred thing because they were on to something that was really getting ready to be big. And I think they, they wanted to be able to get let the dust settle of this. They're, they're going to be known now because they even got the top 15 spot in the top 20 grossing tours right under Madonna at the time. That was a huge deal. They won like the best set, best heavy metal stage set and all that kind of stuff. It was making headlines in magazines and television and news that a heavy metal band never did before besides Kiss. When you think of like Jakey e. Lee didn't get his publishing on Bark at the Moon, at least Ronnie always gave the publishing, right? Well, even, you know, I mean, it's that's a tough, a, a touchy subject because I understand Jake shouldn't have gotten a, a bad deal, I think. And I think that's why those guys came to me afterwards, too, of Vinny and Jimmy and Claude, because publishing was also another way to make money. They weren't making money off T-shirt sales or ticket sales or album sales. They'd make money off of publishing until they were an equal share band. So that was really, you know, but they were getting paid really well. But... When I first joined the band, Ronnie said, okay, this is how it runs. Me and Jimmy write together first, and then we bring in Viv, and then we bring in the rest of the band. I go, okay. So he said, okay, so while me and Jimmy are working, you know, just come up with as many ideas as you can, and, and then I'll call you when we're ready for you to come in. I said, okay. So I came up with like 136 ideas. And Ronnie actually called me and said, no, Goldie, I don't think Jimmy's really into this right now. So you're up, kid. Because I guess Jimmy and Viv were really close. And I understand that. My heart goes out to them. You know, I have compassion for they left. They lost their friend over something. Because if it really was as black and white as Viv said, I would have thought everybody would have quit. And not just Viv. 
it, there's something murky in there. There's a gray area there that I don't think everybody touched on. And publishing is a weird thing. Melody lines and lyrics are 50% of the song, and the music is 50% of the song. So when you look on those Dio albums and you read all melody lines and lyrics by Ronnie James Dio, well, that's not just because he's proud of his lyrics and his melody lines, but that he worked himself up to getting the lion's share because he didn't exactly get what he was promised in Black Sabbath or Rainbow. So in a way, it was kind of like, it's almost like parents and kids. You know, if, if, a, if a parent is raised by an abusive father and mother, then that kid kind of becomes an abusive father or mother. And then somewhere along the line, the cycle stops or it continues. You know, with me, it stopped with me. I was raised by very abusive parents, but it stopped with me when I became a parent, even a step-parent. No way was that was I going to talk to those kids or act to those kids the way I was spoken to. They were not going to go in and out of hospitals and have surgeries and stitches because of beatings that they were put on there. I wasn't even going to lay a hand on them. I was going to make sure that the, just be what I call the, the four F's, fair, fun, firm, and follow through. You can't go wrong with a kid if you're fun and you're fair and you're firm and you have follow through. But anyways... I think a lot of that came all along with Ronnie. When he got screwed over by Richie and by Black Sabbath, it was his turn to make the lion's share. And so he was trying to get to a spot where he felt he deserved. And once he got to that spot, he felt he deserved. I think it was at that point that he was ready to share because he was a very generous man. I just think it was a promise deferred. And, and I think Vivian called him on it too soon is all I think. Because why would Vinny and Jimmy stay? Because they were the ones who had the names before that band even started. So if anybody had a complaint, you would have think it would have been Jimmy and Vinny. Well, I thought they just stayed because, um, I mean, at least they were getting something to go out. It's got to be still scary to leave a project. Even for Vivian, it must have been scary. But having said all that, the melody, I don't think that's acknowledged enough. Even when people are like, oh, Ozzy didn't do anything. But Ozzy came up with melody. And that is such a key part to any Absolutely. song. Going back to the... The publishing, if we just did the math, see, this is the problem, because Ronnie was the focal point of that band. And like even when I wrote with David Lee Roth, um, it's still, it's 50-50. But the deal was, is that whatever you wrote with David Lee Roth, because he was the name, he got an automatic 50%. Even if I wrote the whole song, lyrics, melody, line, and everything, he got an automatic 50%. And there's a lot of guys that do that, but... Um, and you're right about Melody Line, because that when I was uh, when I wrote for Dream Evil, uh, Warner Brothers signed me to their publishing company so I could write songs for them. And that's where I learned that the, the law of songwriting is exactly what you said, and you hit it right. You do that all the time. You, you hit things right on the head. It's melody first, and then it's lyric second. So when you really think about it, a song is a story or a conversation that you're having with the listener within a musical environment. The melody line dictates how many syllables you have to tell that story. That's why it's so difficult to write songs that really mean something, that have the, a strong melody and strong lyrics. That's what people don't understand. That's where the real skill and talent comes into, because once you've established the melody, that limits how many syllables you have to tell your story. And you have to rhyme. So people really do have to have a gift. And those, people's, those people who come up with really good melody lines aren't truly gifted. You're right. And what happens is, is that if we do the math, if we just sit and do the math, melody lines and lyrics are 50%, music is 50%. So if Ronnie's writing all the lyrics and all the melody lines, that's automatically 50% of every song. So then there's only 50% left over between four other guys. So you couldn't get more than 25%. You couldn't even get 25% because 25 and 25 is 50. So 50% 50 had to be split between four guys. I think that's like 1250. Then if Ronnie wrote some of the music, then he also gets a portion of that other 50. So now he's getting 60 and 70%. So now there's only 30% sometimes left over to split between four other guys. That's why people start thinking that, hey, I'm getting screwed because my riff, you know, like smoke on the water. It's hard to say which has more equity the lyrics and melody lines of Smoke on the Water or that riff. And a lot of it is, unfortunately, the law has nothing to do with how you feel. I think there are some songs on the Dio album where you wrote the music solely, right, by yourself? Yeah, there's times when we did a 50-50 split, but most of the time there was other people and Ronnie were involved in the music, so they, we would have to divvy it up. Likewise, there was times when I didn't even get the credit that I was due. 
a lot of it was because sometimes I just didn't want to speak up. Like you were saying, sometimes you're in such a good position, you don't want to rock the boat. You know, like on that album, Killing the Dragon, you know, I wrote a lot of that Killing the Dragon song. I don't have credit for that. I wrote Push, Throw Away Children, and Rock and Roll. But um, almost all of the music on Killing the Dragon was me and Jimmy, and mainly me. And you didn't get publishing on that? No. Why but I was out of the band at that time. So what had happened is I really couldn't keep an eye on things because at the time I was married, I was I had a, a wife who lived in Denmark and I was getting ready to call her to break up with her because things just weren't, weren't working out. But before I could get the words out, she said she was pregnant. So I had to do the right thing. So I, we got married and I, you know, I took care of the kid. I was riding with Ronnie and I had a full-time job that I took the bus to so she could have the car. That's what my dad did. So I went backwards, you know, because I remember my dad would take the bus to go be a police officer and leave the car at home for my mom so she could use the car. And so that's what I did. So I took three buses to get to a job, an eight hour job, and then take the bus over to Ronnie's. And then Ronnie would pick me up at the closest corner and we'd go work. And then I'd have to go back to the house. I would be up all night because the baby would cry all night long and he would only be able to sleep on my chest. And so Ronnie was asking me, he goes, are you going to be able to do the tour? Because he wanted the same guitar player to do the tour that's on the album. And at first I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this was before the baby was born. I got to go backwards a little bit. Turned out that the due date was the same date that the tour was starting. And the mother of the child sold her business and moved all the way from Europe to America. I couldn't in good conscience leave a person who had just moved from Europe and has never lived in America to give birth to my one and only son, and I'm not even there. So they got they brought Doug in. I was already I was already recording the album. We were already in the studio recording the album, and then they brought Doug in because I couldn't do the tour. But they asked me back for Master of the Moon because it was you know I didn't leave because I wanted to. It's because I I I felt that was the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. 